Hi there. You're listening to the LLB podcast, the podcast for law students and young lawyers. My name is Johnny Nguyen, and I'll be your host today. Welcome to episode 15 of the podcast. Today's episode features Mailing Lee Ortiz, the managing counsel for labor and employment at Toyota Motor North America. The focus of today's episode is on reverse mentoring and how junior employees can make the most out of it. On the way there, we also touch on other aspects of May's career, including her interest in employment law, the ways that she's backed herself through changes in career and environment, and her passion for leadership and giving back. She's got a really interesting story, going from being the daughter of refugees in a small town to moving to working in big law and now obviously in her current role working for a global corporation as in-house counsel. I found this episode personally enlightening and hope that you get a lot out of listening to it too. Let's get started. May, to kick us off, uh, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, probably what I do is probably the easiest question. Uh, so I'll start with that first. I, uh, what do I do? I am an employment lawyer at Toyota Motor North America. Uh, that's a company that I'm sure you're familiar with our brand, but um, we build, we design, build, and uh, sell cars, right? We have a different sister company called Toyota Financial Services that finances the cars. And as far as what I actually do there, you know, besides uh, defending the company whenever we get employment litigation. I also help, you know, provide advice and counsel to business on, you know, various projects they may have, um, as well as create and conduct compliance training, like non-harassment training, non-discrimination training, that type stuff. And as far yeah. as who I am, uh, <laughs> May Ortiz, I go by May. I am uh, a daughter of immigrants. My parents are refugees from the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. I am a wife to a Navy veteran, and I'm mom of a three-year-old and a five-year-old. Awesome, awesome. And it sounds like a a lot of what you do right now is quite important in um, the the landscape when we're seeing a lot of employment issues arise. So following up on that journey, can you tell us about how you got to where you are today with, you know, between being a daughter of refugees to our legal counsel at Toyota? What's that journey sort of looked like? Yeah, I don't think we have enough time to go through it all. But, <laughs> but I mean, first and foremost, I didn't want to respond to the comment about just the legal landscape with COVID-19 and a global pandemic. I will tell you that if you did not know your employment before, employment lawyer before, companies know now because we were in high demand and trying to figure out, you know, all the regulations and and how to safely have employees at the workplace. Right. But as far as my journey, um, I grew up in small town, Texas. Um, For those of you not familiar with the United States, it's like the South, mid South. Um, And when I say small town, there were about 5,000 people in my town growing up. And we were the only Asian Americans in the whole little town. Um, And I provide that context because I think it's important to understanding um, perhaps my worldview. Um, And then so I went to undergraduate in Texas. I went to law school in Texas. And as far as my journey, I I did want to share that within my first semester, my 1L year, first year of law school, I was bottom half of my class. And while I graduated with honors, you know, by the end of the year, I mean, the end of the three years, I think it's important to start off with that because it was a, I had a slow start, you know, I had to figure it out, like what law school was like. Um, I did not have a job until three days before taking the Texas bar. And um, I'm convinced to this day that they, that the partner gave me a job probably because no one showed up to the interview. I mean, you know, I, I literally, people were like, oh, I would never interview right now because, you know, everyone's so focused about studying for the bar. Uh, small, small firm. There were two partners. I was the only associate. Uh, commercial right litigation. Time, right place, right? Yeah, yeah, I really was. I mean, I was just so 
lucky to get a job. I mean, I was seriously considering being a Starbucks barista instead of barrister, just because, you know, I heard they had good benefits. Um, and so I was at, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, so after the small firm for five years, I joined, uh, I guess what you would call big law, a big firm, uh, doing just employment law. So I switched practices as a fifth year, um, as far as, as well as size of practice, right? So yep. two, three lawyer firm to suddenly um, a thousand lawyer firm. Um, but my office was about mm, 40 attorneys in, in Texas. And then there for five years, and then I've been, and then I moved in house to Toyota, and I've been here, it'll be five years in May. Welcome. And I mean, following up on a couple of things, but let's start Thanks. out with why employment law? It seems like you had a decent interest in employment law coming into big law and you, you've you've specialized since then what's the interest here for you yeah i think you know this is part of what's so important i think for lawyers to really kind of explore and and learn other types of the law i, I think for me commercial litigation and fighting over contracts you know serving um, corporate clients it was fine you know, I mean, I, I enjoyed it fine, but when I discovered employment law and saw kind of the human impact that it had and, and just the connection with people, it, it seemed like a, a better fit. And quite frankly, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, document review in a securities litigation, boo. you know, document review in the sexual harassment case, kind of interesting, like TMZ. It's a lot more confronting, but I, I think you're right. It, it is a lot more human in the sense that you're not necessarily fighting over numbers and figures, right? Right. So, I mean, following up on the second thing here, um, you mentioned that you were you grew up in Texas and you grew up in small town Texas in a, a town of five thousand people. Coming then into like you seem to transition from a lot of different environments. So, small town went to university. Uh, went into a small firm, then made the transition to big law and then in-house. Across all these things, um, at any point, did you ever have doubts about whether or not you could make that leap of faith from place to place? Oh, absolutely. All the time. I, I, I mean, I think I think that's a normal part of that process and decision making. You know, is this the right job for me? Should I make that leap? Um, and I think from my experience, just maybe being very security seeking, right? Like taking risks doesn't come naturally to me because, you know, I've seen firsthand how hard my parents have worked. So it's like, well, you know, I should just have a good job and that should be sufficient. You know, that was kind of like how it was brought up. So, and, so and legal training doesn't help with that either, right? Like legal training doesn't <laughs> necessarily go, oh, take risks. You're right. You're right. You know, so, um, so yeah, to, to, to your question there, there's always, um, opportunities for doubt. And then me personally, and I know that we've talked about this a little bit before. Um, but you know, I also have struggled with imposter syndrome. And that certainly doesn't help to have that kind of running narrative in my head of you're not good enough. So and any quick tips there? Like, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? Yeah, I mean, for me, my my kind of little trick, so to speak, is really to save the positive affirmation I get from clients or from people I work with or from my managers and I save them in one place so that whenever, you know, my mind is making up this false narrative that I'm not good enough or I don't know what I'm doing, I can say objectively, all these people have told me that I know what I'm doing, right? And not only that I know what I'm doing, but I do it really well. And I think having that objective affirmation from someone else, right, is, is just really helpful. It's such a good trick, and I feel like it's such a lawyer thing to do, though. It seems like <laughs> you're with imposter syndrome, you're literally just gathering evidence to prove it wrong. And yes. it's very much a lawyer thing to do. Yes. Um, okay, so, mate, I wanted to talk about today's, I guess, focus on mentoring. So to kick us off there, can you sort of tell us what sort of work you do in the mentoring sphere? Now, I've seen a lot from you on social media, but, you know, what do you do there? What got you into it? Why are you interested in it? 
Yeah. I mean, my mentorship journey probably started um, right when I graduated law school in 2006. I was uh, really involved in moot court. And I don't know if they have that in Australia. You can tell me if they do or they don't. But yeah, um, do. okay. So you're familiar with it. So it's like you get a set of, you know, fake facts, you write a brief, and you have to argue in front of usually a panel of appellate judges. And I, I just really enjoyed it. it. It really gave me a lot of affirmation in law school, being able to do that. Um, so when I graduated, I was just committed to giving back, right? Because at least at my school, the people who were our coaches did it volunteering. They were not paid. They were busy lawyers, practitioners, or judges who voluntarily gave their time to develop law students. And so I thought that, hey, I basically received three years of this uh, mentoring and that I should also give back. And that's kind of how it started, almost kind of a, not to make it transactional, not to make it quid pro quo, but but I did feel like if I was going to receive all this good you know, investment from others, I should pay it back. So that's how I started. I started coaching. Big shout, out. Big shout out to those moot, moot judges, by the way. Like, oh, yeah. I think, I think I've had um, a current equivalent of like a, a federal judge clerk in, in America, but like, I, I know one of my friends is in New Zealand working on their court of appeal and she used to be a big moot in New Zealand. And she spends a lot of time coaching teams, giving pretty much free voluntary advice to yes. help these teams learn about mooting. So a big shout out to everyone that does that sort of thing. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that when we go through it, we're really passionate about it because I'm sure like as your friend could probably attest to, um, yes, we're passionate about it because we did it, but we also see the benefit, right? Like, like if you've been through it, then when you have that first hearing in front of a judge, you're not as freaked out because you've been practicing for like two or three years. It's less horrifying every time you, you practice, get grilled, fall apart, but then eventually make it together. Right. So, you know, that's how I started. I, I would coach, you know, a team and I've coached every year since 2006. I did take a break in 2014 um, because I had other um, leadership obligations. But yeah, I, so so every year I at least had four to eight students that I mentored in that capacity. Um but then outside of that, you know, beyond that, I'm just a huge proponent of it. I really do think it is our responsibility as lawyers to invest in our profession. If we don't develop young lawyers, like we can't then complain about them, right? Like, like I hear sometimes all the time, oh, these young lawyers, they do this, they do that. And I'm like, okay, well, do you do something to teach them? And do you do something to coach them? Or are you just going to complain about them? Then I think that's the piece where I don't know, like if you're not willing to invest in people and help people develop, then you really, if you're not going to help fix the problem, I don't need to hear you complain about it. So that that's just a personal philosophy of mine. Um, a part of the solution, you're part of the problem, right? And yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's actually quite similar to, I know, the reason why one of the uh, adjuncts at my uni teaches trial advocacy. He, he, I think he, he literally said that he and a couple of other um, judges were sitting around and they were just saying, you know, the state of advocates these days, <laughs> not up to scratch. And then it's like, you know what? I'm I'm not just going to sit here and do that. After I retire, I'm going to come back to university and make sure that they are up to scratch. And he's been yeah. going, going at it for, I think, a good 10 years. And he's, there's a generation of tr- trial advocates out there at this point in Australia that have been taught by, I think, um, Justice Sully and Justice Collier at Western Sydney. So that, that was pretty much their motivation. They were like, nope, not up to scratch. We're going we're gonna to do something about it. <laughs> yeah, and I love that. I love that because I've, I've seen perhaps, you know, in big law, sometimes because of time constraints or, or whatever the, the reason may be, partners don't take the time to invest in teaching their associates yet at the same time, they may complain that they don't have good associates. Well, there's a reason for that, right? So, um, and it's a whole art in and of itself, because I think at the same time, like we, we do legal work, but then th- this art of teaching and mentoring others is something quite separate to that and not necessarily mm-hmm. directly connected. But I, I guess to sort of pivot away from that as well, can you tell us about this concept of reverse mentoring? Because I've, I've seen you post a lot about it and it's quite interesting to see uh, that dynamic shift from, you know, 
that hierarchy of mentoring someone more senior, giving back to someone junior, but then this concept of reverse mentoring, someone more junior potentially giving to someone more senior. What is that? What's what's the go here? Yeah. I mean, you basically, you know, describe it in a nutshell, right? It, it is, like you said, someone more junior um, teaching or mentoring someone more senior. Uh, the concept really was seen first in corporate America. So I forget if, if it was like maybe a CEO of General Electric here. Was it Jack Welch maybe? Yeah, it, it, um, it sounds very much like a Jack Welch thing. <laughs> read a lot of articles and be like, yeah, that's a Jack Welch thing. Yeah, yeah. And and I think, you know, in, in that corporate space, um, you know, the, the problem they were seeing were there a lot of millennials leaving the workforce, right? And and um, companies were losing a lot of younger talent. And, you know, and part of it could be that, you know, the culture at these various companies hadn't changed. So it started in corporate America. But, you know, I think that concept is really helpful um, to our legal profession and, and to developing relationships. Because if you really want to have a strong mentoring relationship, I think as a mentee, if you can show your value in that Hi, mentor. I appreciate all this knowledge and time you're pouring into me, but I also have valuable information and skills that I can help you. And it just makes the relationship more meaningful. Yeah, definitely. And to help all of us understand here, what sort of value do, you know, junior employees offer to more senior employees? We can, you've got to talk about the benefits in that it helps to bridge that connection and potentially drive cultural change but what exactly are we often talking about like how is this achieved through reverse mentoring yeah well at a company so it certainly helps with you know driving cultural change it helps with employee engagement and retention um again from a company standpoint it really helps with diversity right because when we talk about diversity we are talking more than just you know people of color or gender we're talking about diversity of thought right whether someone came from a big town a small you know small town where someone came from a different socioeconomic status, all of that, right? Um, it informs your worldview, right? Well, yeah. It's all yeah. part of who you are. Yes, exactly. And so so when you have a, an avenue for people to share more of that, right, um, I think it just really lends to the growth and development of really of a company. And then from a lawyer perspective, I think this can, you know, from a mentee and who is the younger associate or the younger lawyer, this really allows a person to really stand out and get visibility for, you know, they're at their firm or, you know, in their, you know, it, within their sphere of influence, because it's recognizing that you have, you know, skills or something that you can help, you know, a senior partner or senior attorney um, grow as well. And an example of that, if I may, um, is that my first partner, like I sort of, he, he has a running joke. Um, he was like, may taught me to text. Um, and, and, but it, it changed, you know, he was like, and it changed my life, this simple thing. Um, you know, that's obviously a really a small, you know, funny example, but, but I will share like at Toyota, for example, we do reverse mentoring in that we have um, employees of our um, BPGs, so we call them business partnering groups. So there are affinity groups, whether it's like African American or Asian um, API. One of you know one of a member of a BPG is paired with an executive, right? Someone not like them, so that we're really um, mentoring in the diversity space, right. Where people have a safe place to share personal narratives and experiences, which a lot of times can be more powerful than, you know, an off the shelf training. Right. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think the value in that as well, I think is that often it's, it's just exposure that leads to better outcomes for diversity. A lot of the times people could hold ignorant reviews just because they've never been exposed to someone of a of any certain uh, class or group or whatever type right. we're talking about. And just by having them interact with each other and having that exposure, you're often creating, you're driving those outcomes for diversity in the first place. But can, can I also ask you, in terms of an example, have you personally been on the other end of reverse mentoring? So, you know, you taught the senior partner how to text. Have Has a junior employee been partnered with you at any point that has taught you something? And have you benefited from reverse mentoring? 
Yeah. So I have a couple of, I'll say I only mentor, I want to say a handful of employees at Toyota, but a lot of my mentees are actually, you know, law students and young lawyers, you know, outside of work. And in that space, I have a couple of mentees. One, not introduce me, I knew Instagram, but I wasn't really comfortable using it. I, I, you know, I mean, this is going to date me, but I am more comfortable with Facebook and LinkedIn. And so, you know, she showed me kind of some tips and tricks and it really, you know, I mean, that was just really helpful. Right. Um, And then I have another mentee who is like so fabulous that when I started doing videos, I mean, he looked at them and he was like, hey, 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 we can do so much better. And he, he edits my little videos about mentoring and he does a fantastic job. And it's something that he refuses to be compensated for. You know, he's a busy private practice attorney. So, I mean, we don't have deadlines or anything. Whenever I make a video, I send it to him and whenever he edits it, that's fine. You know, but I mean, that is a really great example of reverse mentoring, right? Like I don't have the skill set he does and it comes easy to him where for me, I literally was like looking for classes to how to learn how to edit video. I'm actually with you on that. So my example would probably be, I have a mentee who does all of my branding for the podcast, actually. So uh, they know how to use Canva properly and I, I struggle a lot with it. I'm, I'm still trying to learn and I'm trying to take a bit of the load off them. But uh, yeah, they, they grant my logo. They do all of the, the announcement uh, templates for me. They've, they've made an entire branding folder for me on, uh, on Google Drive that we share together. And they process requests for me. So, you know, you're going to have to send me through your face at one point and they're going to put it into the template and make an announcement template for you. But um, that's probably my example of reverse mentoring too. Like, I, I think yes, it's, exactly. I think this whole mentoring thing, though, is just recognition that just because you're more senior doesn't mean that you're necessarily better at everything. I think there's okay. probably recognition that there are different dimensions of capability. Like you might be an amazing lawyer, but you might not necessarily be great with Instagram or Canva, etc. And so reverse re- mentoring really sort of delineates this idea that um, I think seniority is directly correlated with our competence so on, on all dimensions so I think reverse mentoring is really important in that sense so yeah and I think it's also powerful um that for someone who is more senior or perhaps has more power in a company for example that senior person has to be vulnerable right mm-hmm. to admit that I don't have all the answers that I don't know how to do this younger person can you help me And we all know that vulnerability and empathy really helps uh, gel relationships, right? So so, so there's just immense power in the strength of that relationship just from from the fact that it's a reverse mentoring relationship. I know that as well. Since you mentioned vulnerability, I also think about it in terms of retaining like a growth mindset because Mm -hmm. in order to be that vulnerable state and accept that they don't know something, you're basically forcing these people to accept that there are things that they aren't necessarily the best at to to know that they can continue learning. And I I think it's both something that you have to have coming in, but it's something that will be cemented by the experience itself and reminds you that there is always growth to be had. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. I think that that that's exactly right. And I think even when we look at, you know, you and I obviously share, you know, we geek on leadership, obviously, you know, listen to Jack Welch and also there's even a shift in leadership, right? It, it maybe perhaps was seen very authoritarian and I have all the answers because I'm the leader. And, and I think with this growth mindset and vulnerability and empathetic leadership, we've really seen how it's transformed companies. Um, and they've really had exponential growth because because of the the transformative leadership that has that has occurred. I think it well, we're sort of seeing that shift more generally across um, I think the, the private sector and the public sector. So in Australia, for example, I know that we've started introducing the idea of a youth board member directly on board. So there are companies mm-hmm. out there, and I think there's a lot of like nonprofits, for example, that always try to have a person under a certain age, like I usually think 35, 30, 25, depending on, uh, I think, demand. But they'll usually try to have a young person on board that can directly weigh in on any decisions that directly affects 
you know, young people as a stakeholder within a company, within a campaign, etc. And I think that is that diversity of thought, recognizing right. that you can add value even with without experience per se, and that might actually be the value that you add, seeing right. things through fresh eyes. So, I guess to, to pivot here as well, looking at uh, I guess how we can do reverse mentoring right. Given that you know Toyota's done reverse mentoring for a while. Can you sort of share generally here how junior employees, so the mentors in this relationship and the mentees, that is the senior, senior employees, how can each side of the, uh, the equation here do their best to make reverse mentoring beneficial? What can they sort of be doing to do things right? Yeah, I think um, the mentors in the space who are uh, the younger or, or you know, the, the younger person in the in this relationship. I think it's important to drive the relationship still. Um, I know that usually when we talk about a traditional mentoring relationship, we say mentee should drive it. And it may seem a little bit unfair, like, wait, 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 the younger person still has to drive the relationship. Um, But I think to be a really good one, recognizing that perhaps the person you're your mentee is still an executive or still someone with a lot of, you know, time constraints that you should still be the one to drive the relationship. You know, you try yeah. to, you know, meet with their executive assistant and try to get a regular cadence of meeting, you know. Uh, um, so I think that's still really important. And also because you're the mentor, you're really going to have to have some intentionality, right? How do I present whatever I'm trying to present in a very efficient way? Um, I've met my fair share of executives. Their attention span is very limited, not because of any, you know, acute mental acuity. It's like they are thinking and juggling so many things. And so you've got to get to the point about whatever you're trying to teach or show. Um, so I, right. Right. So I really think you have to be really intentional about like, okay, in this 30 minutes, this is the, the bite size, whatever we're going to cover. And this is why it's important to them. Right. Um, And then on both sides, I think it's really important to set expectations, right? How often do we want to meet? How long do you want to meet? What do we each want to get out of this? And and make it really clear so that you are still achieving your why. Definitely. It it sounds like, uh, I think one common mistake that often happens in mentoring relationships generally, not just reverse mentoring, but it's that lack of planning and intentionality for, you know, mentors might not necessarily know exactly what they're going to say. They don't know what they, the value they have to offer. And mentees often don't know what value they can get. They don't know what they're going to get out of it. And mm-hmm. it's like the common thing from reverse mentoring and mentoring here is that you do need to have some sort of plan of action in place and you need to get to the point quickly because I think you need to reverse mentoring. The mentee is very time constrained and is the executive. <laughs> yeah. So looking then at, I suppose, how junior employees can benefit from this, although they're the mentor, are there any ways that you suggest they can make the most in terms of what sort of benefits they can get out of the mentoring relationship? Yeah, I think the key here is um, relationship building, right? You as the mentor and the younger person, you're getting access to an executive or access to someone who is very senior to you. Um, that's visibility, right? That that's visibility. That is access. That is, you know, more information, um, and that could possibly turn into sponsorship in some ways, right? So, so it's really just an opportunity that not everyone gets to have. So, for sure, that's something that's going to be, you know, something that you want to seize. And then, what else do you get out of it other than just that visibility and exposure? Um, I think it's an opportunity for you to learn because what you're going to do is build that relationship. And, and yes, you are going to be mentoring someone on maybe like texting or mentoring someone on social media, but it's still a relationship. You know, when you have, you know, you're going to still chit chat about how was your weekend and how are the kids and all that stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's all about relationship building and, and that's definitely the highest value, I think. I think as well, at times we often use these labels like mentoring on one side, reverse mentoring on the other. But I think in reality, most relationships have some aspects of both, right? Because 
Uh, at, at the same time, you might be teaching this senior partner how to text, but he's probably teaching you uh, part of the law that he knows about. And even in reverse mentoring situations, right, you might be teaching someone, you know, my, my mentee teaches me how to use Canva, but at the same time, I'm providing advice on other things that I know about. And so right. it, it's much, I think it's a two-way street, right? Like we do this label like mentor or reverse mentor, but realistically, you're right. I think it's often just a relationship that's mutually beneficial and we sort of add value each way. And so it's it's a mutual, mutually beneficial, I think, symbiotic relationship. That's the word. I had a lag there for a moment. Like I learned this <laughs> in high school. Symbiotic. That's right. the one. So, Okay, like, I guess moving to the last practical step here on reverse mentoring and maybe mentoring generally here, but if an organization doesn't have existing reverse mentoring uh, infrastructure, so, you know, it's never done it before, how do you think a junior employee might go about pitching this idea to its executives? Like, how, how do we bring this conversation to the table? Yeah, yeah. I think definitely first thing is like do your homework, right? Like like definitely look into it, research a little bit more. Um, you know, there are articles on, you know, and, and bring them, right? Bring the Harvard Business Review, bring the Forbes, right? Th- those highly credible resources to really tout the benefits. Like this is the benefit, you know, to you executive, but really to our company, right? Mm-hmm. Um and, you know, I mean, I think executives really are interested in, you know, how they can better their companies, how they can better the culture and how they can continue to get team member, that's what we call, or employee engagement, right? I think as an executive who is, you know, a leader, they're going to be interested in those things. So do the research, prove your why, right? This is why we should do it. But the other step is also consider the how, Right. I mean, obviously, as the younger junior person, you may not have authority to run the whole program. But what you don't want to happen is be like, okay, now what? And then you go, uh, let me get back to you. Right. Like, like come with Didn't think something. I'd get right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So come with something because I find, you know, with executives, it's easy for them, it's easier for them to conceptualize if they have something to look at. Like, what is this? What could this look like? Um, and quite frankly, I call it a bashing document. It's always easier to bring a bashing document to someone for them to, you know, correct or fix or just say no than to just talk about an idea. Yeah. I mean, it's equivalent to, like, imagine doing legal work and, you know, they're like, hey, um, draft these pleadings. And you're like, okay, well, would they perhaps look like this? And like, it's as easy if like, you can do it and they, you bring it back. And they're like, okay, get rid of this word, get rid of this, insert this right. here. And, and so it's much easier to like have something there that you can actually both co- collectively work on and an idea that's sort of manifested, right? I, I think you're right. very much right in that sense. Okay, so well, I guess like to, to close off like this discussion on reverse mentoring, the last question here might be, okay, if people do want to do their homework, do you have any maybe like your, your top one or two resources on reverse mentoring, possibly mentoring, like whatever you want, you want here, but like top two resources that people can start that homework journey on. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to go with global mentoring generally um, because I mean, with reverse mentoring, you know, I always, I Google, I find resources that I like, um, you know, I try to find reputable ones and I love that Harvard business, you know, review and Forbes had some great articles on that. But I'm mentoring general, so a couple of resources that, that I really like. There is a Mentor in Law, and that's by Nisa Chopra. Um, I think it's mentorinlaw.com, if I'm not mistaken. She's on LinkedIn. Her site is a treasure trove of resources for, for mentoring, for both mentors and mentees. Books, podcasts, articles, the, you know, those type of tangible resources if you want to look into it more. Um, but also from what my interest, you know, young lawyers and law students is that there are always, um, I guess, articles by very, not articles, but I don't know what you call them, but basically, you know, all these lawyers are asked, you know, five or six questions, like what advice would you give your younger self? You know, the stuff that you would normally ask in like a mentoring call, it's all there for you at your fingertips. 
yeah, fantastic. It it sounds like pretty much the library of mentoring here. Like, and I'll, I'll chuck up links to that. Uh, I'll, I'll crack it out and I'll hyperlink it where necessary. And yeah, okay. and then uh, another, if I may, um, is Leg Up Legal. That is by Angie. Um, mm. She's on LinkedIn as well, and she has again incredible resources. She has YouTube videos on various topics. Um, so that's also a great resource. I think she has a regular li- live event as well. And she is very big. And I mean, across the Atlantic or the Pacific. <laughs> what about oceans between us? Right. Uh, what about <laughs> oceans between us? Across that. Yes. Um, I, I think she's got a following in Australia too. I've, I've seen a lot of people. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and she's big in Australia. I'll, I'll, I'll hop the link her. I'll tag her in the post as well. But yeah. Um, any other resources or, or like no no pressure at this point like I yeah said yeah too, so like, the, yeah 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 what well, there's another um website it's called color of law see you know color of law dot us so it's not a dot com so it's color of law dot us it is written by um Richard Amador he is an attorney in California here in the states and he's really passionate about mentoring um attorneys who are underprivileged, you know, usually, you know, attorneys of color, but not necessarily just underprivileged, underrepresented. And he has some, you know, great blogs in that space as well. Oh, fantastic. And I think these three resources are probably really great starts to the journey of mentoring here. I guess, thank you for having that chat and mentoring here. So let's close up with some, I guess, feel good advice here. Do you have any general advice career advice here for any listeners that might be listening keeping in mind that I think a lot of listeners are law students slash young lawyers yeah yeah I do so three things come to mind I think the first thing that comes to mind is really identify your why and then revisit often um you know I channel Simon Sinek start with why literally what I was thinking (laughs) hey we are we are on this leadership book um journey but you know, I think sometimes, you know, your why and my why, so for example, like my why at first was I need to graduate from law school and get a job. That's it. I need financial security, right? But at some point, that's not enough, right? Some point you want fulfillment, sometimes, you know, at some point you want to look at are you growing? Um, you know, is this a career you want? Are you, you know, um, living your best life, like all that type stuff? I think it's important to remember your why um, so that um, you can really live, you know, a fulfilling career. I think, you know, let's be honest, there, there are so many times they hear about lawyers who are unhappy and they don't like their work. And I think part of it could be they haven't really visited. Well, why did they get in the first place? And, and does it still serve their life? The second thing I would say is um, a reminder to law students and young lawyers. I get that law schools make us really competitive. I mean, I remember the, the little talk that they gave me. It was like, look to your right and look to your left and not everybody will be here by the end of three years. I mean, that's, that's I don't know why they start that way, but I know the school experience is really competitive, but the practice of law is really not a race. It's really not a race. Your career trajectory is not really a ladder. Um, it can be at a firm, right? I mean, there's the associate and partner and there it could be hierarchical but it doesn't have to be, right? And um, and if you get sucked into climbing a ladder or running a race, you lose your why, right? And instead, you know, I mean, just like the other saying, comparison is the thief of joy. Like I talk with so many young lawyers and they're like, oh, well, so-and-so is getting to do a deposition or so-and-so is getting to do that. And I'm like, you'll get to too, don't worry, right? And it's more, and I have a blog post on this. Instead of a race, it's more like an Easter egg hunt. Everyone's going to hunt for eggs. You know, you're going to find golden eggs this time, chocolate eggs this time, but you're going to find your eggs. Like, like you don't need to f- have this extra pressure to be first all the time, you know? And then the last one, I also have a blog post on this. It's keep a running done list. Yes, I know most of us have a to-do list, but it's important to keep a done list. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you um, get experience doing a deposition, you know, write it down and, and do this every year. And it doesn't have to be something formal, but whenever it's your review time, 
it's going to be easier than at the end of the year saying, well, dang, what have I done? And, and how do I stand out for my peers? I have no idea because I don't remember what I did yesterday. If you keep a running list of substantive things that you've done, I mean, it's not a resume, right? It's not a, it's not a formal thing. It's literally like MSJs with like, I've done five MSJs or, or six hearings, or I've done eight deals. Like just keep track of that. So you can talk about it in your review. Um, and then aside from okay, that, jump in there actually. Um, yeah, please. I actually keep my to-do list and my done list in the same place in the sense that oh. um, I, I use an Excel spreadsheet so that, you know, I map out, you know, uh, I have a couple of col- columns, so it might be, um, you know, brief description of tasks, skills learned, uh, deadline, and then, you know, I'll, I'll sort them by deadline so I know what's coming my way. But as I, as I finish off tasks, I just hide the rows that I've already done. And then, I'll you know, I'll keep going down uh, each row and adding more and more and more. And, you know, by the, by the end of like a rotation, I might get to appraisal time and, you know, I'll, I'll unhide the last 60 or 70 rows or so. And I might not put every single entry of that into my appraisal, but it'll give me really great visibility over mm. what I've done. And again, as I said, like, I think I think we've all experienced this before, but you get to appraisal and you're like, uh, I, I know I've done work for the last couple of months, but I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not not too clear what it was. I definitely can't speak about it, but if, if you bring it up, I'll probably be able to remember, but you, you're obviously not going to bring it up. So I, th- I guess I'll just go with these two things that I've done. And right. so, you know, like, it does prevent that. So I, I keep them in the same place. I keep them in an Excel sheet. You know, to-do list and done list are, to me, like, the same thing. One's just hidden a lot of the time, and the other is ongoing. So a little tip yeah. from me to add on that. I love it. I love it. And honestly, I think you should do a little webinar on it. Obviously, with fake stuff. So it's not, you know, yeah. turning client privilege on the wave. But yeah. I think a lot of law students and young lawyers would benefit from seeing different lawyers systems, right? Because I have a system and it's different. You have a system that's different. But the point is we've created an intentional system to capture Mm -hmm. this so we don't rely on memory alone. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, on to your third tip, I think, or possibly whatever was that that was there before I cut you off. That was my third tip, the done list. Oh, sorry, I just cut you off with something. But, um, you know, I guess... Now that we've wrapped that up, so I guess I wanted to talk about some stuff that people could connect with you on. So I guess first question is, where are you sort of? I know you're on LinkedIn. Anything else that people can connect with you on? Are you happy for them to connect with you on LinkedIn, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, LinkedIn is probably where I would, I I visit the most. So on LinkedIn, um, I also have my blog. It's a personal blog and it's called the maybe.com. So T H E M E Y B E.com. Um, oh, I see my, what you did there. Yes. The maybe <laughs> the possibility. Um, and then I have a YouTube channel that my mentee is helping me. He, he created it and he put these videos on there and it's also, it's all about the maybe. Um, and, and it's, it's just in its infancy. I mean, I think there are like three videos, um, but it's just so much fun. Um, and I think those those are good. I think those are great places uh, to connect on. And then as far as like things that I'm really excited to learn about, like obviously leadership books, which I, if you have suggestions, um, but yeah, I'm really passionate about mentoring. I'm passionate, passionate about diversity, inclusion and belonging. Um, and I love productivity and efficiency hacks, like learning about people's systems. Like it just, mm. I get excited about that stuff. I don't know why. Oh, for sure. T- tell me how to be more productive. I'm, I'm all into it too. Yes. Well, May, uh, thank you for coming on to the, the podcast and chatting. It's been a really great chat. We've covered a really great range of topics. And, you know, I think your, your three actionable tips were actually quite useful. Thanks for coming and um, have a great weekend. Thanks. You too. Thanks for having me.